lot. Chuck Whitaker was born in Joliet, Illinois. At 22, he joined the Navy. Completing basics at the Great Lakes Training Center, he served on the aircraft carrier, the USS Forrestal, as a bosom mate. However, his true passion was to cook, of which he soon became one. While in South China Sea, tragic struck. The Forrestal accidentally caught fire, destroying many of its planes, but more tragically killing 134 sailors. While in dry dock in Norfolk, Virginia, Chuck ended his active duty. He then went on to own a few restaurants, eventually worked and retired from the Edison Company in Morris, Illinois, where he lived with his wife, Sharon, and their two children. Retiring to the villages, he enjoys volunteering and working in his garden. Chuck comes to us today wearing his Honor Flight hat, and you'll notice he's wearing a shirt because he volunteers for the Honor Guard at the VFW Post in Bellevue, Post 8083. And Chuck just tells me if any of you are in that area and wish to be in the Honor Guard, they're looking for more volunteers. So if you want to do that, check it out. But I am here today to welcome Chuck. And we're going to have a little bit different of a speaker today. We actually have WVHF TV show live with us and our moderator Joe Hambright is going to be questioning our guest speaker Chuck Whitaker. Okay, are you ready to work Chuck? I you certainly want to, am. You want to tell us about this? This is my uh, quilt that was given to me on the 50th flight which I was on and this was my choice. <laughs> That's what these quilts mean to our veterans. So everybody's gotten them since we started our organization and will continue to do so. Do you want to change hats? You want to change hats, Chuck? I certainly will. Now what is this hat? This? This hat here, <laughs> this hat here, I actually used in six, from 64 to 67. And then when I got out and opened my two restaurants up, I wore it and I served Navy Chow. <laughs> Regardless of two boxes and a yearbook, uh, I took two recipes out of each box and put them in a little glass glassine folder for you to look at. So please be careful when looking through the box and be careful turning the pages of a four star yearbook. They're not making them anymore. And it doesn't work like they had this like they used to. Try. <laughs> Thank you. How do I look? <laughs> Tell us about your military career. How long you were in and what you did and yada yada yada. So take a few minutes and tell us about your military career. Well, it was, uh, I was 22 years old and I got drafted, went up to Chicago, took the physical, and before they said I do, and I said I do, I joined the Navy. <laughs> so, every, but I spent four years in the regular, and then when I got out, I spent another four years in the Naval Reserve. At the same time, I had my two restaurants, and then when the Naval uh, Detachment moved from Joliet to Chicago, that's when I bowed out. I didn't have enough time. So. Before we get into some of the specific things that you did and places you visited, Chuck, you were on the forestall uh, during the fire. Uh, 
in July of 1967. What do you remember about that, and, and were any of your people in the galley crew affected by this? Well, this was probably the worst thing that ever happened. The rocket that went off from the one plane into the plane that was in back of the plane that was getting ready to get thrown off the catapults got exploded. Senator McCain was in the plane that was being launched. He jumped out. He was quite lucky, but anyway, it's when uh, I went down. The initial blast took and jarred all the bombs that were on the planes. Thousand pounders, two fifties, five hundred pounders. They were all going off. This was really. Could this be us that it was happening to? As soon as they, uh, they went from fire quarters to general Q, you know, general quarters, and you uh, you have to go down to your everybody's got their general quarter station. That's where they take a, a head count, see if anybody is not that's missing. But uh, while I was going down the ladders from the flight deck, because I was on the bridge, I used to go up every day. I had a friend of mine that was a video, that used to run the video recorder. Anyway, uh, I used to go up and see him every day. But Going down the ladder, it was heck, because these bombs were just blowing and shaking the whole, shaking the whole ship, and it was really bad. And more bombs were dropping down into the holes that were blown by the larger bombs. So. Uh, yeah. When I got down to the galley, I worked in the aft galley at night. All the guys were down there and they were evacuating that part of the ship because the bombs had blown through. If I would have been in my earthing quarters at that time, I wouldn't be standing here. But, uh, yeah. Let's get on to some of the better stuff. Okay. Well, tell, how many tours did you take? How long did they take? And what, what, what did you do? Where did you go on your, your, your cruises? I guess a cruise like uh, the open, open bar and buffets and uh, <laughs> entertainment or? Right. I, I, was, I was on two Mediterranean cruises. Okay, Mediterranean cruise, okay. It was wonderful. All through Italy and France and Turkey and uh, Beirut, Lebanon. It was great. I really enjoyed that. But then we got our number pulled up that we were going to Vietnam. So it was. It was quite a it, it was really hard to, to conceive that we were gonna go over there. I, I I have a hard time concentrating when it becomes this stuff to talk about anyway. 
So how long does no cruise normally last, Chuck? Uh, every time that a supercarrier went out, it went out for nine months. We load up the ship with all the stores, and then we go out. As soon as we get out to o get out to sea, all the the uh, Airplanes would come in, and they'd land, and they'd stow them down in the, the hangar bay. But well, at the end of these nine months, you came back for for a period of time. How long were you back in port? And what did you do while they there? Did you go home while they were in port, or, or what? No, we just we just stayed we stayed aboard ship. When we came in, we came into Pier 12. That was our pier. And then we went to Norfolk Naval Shipyard into Dry Dock, and uh, they cut away the ship and re outfitted it. You said the cruise was nine months long. You couldn't carry enough food for nine months, I, I guess, in an aircraft carrier. So how did you get additional food to the carrier? Well, we got, we got uh, replenishment at sea. You get a freighter, cargo ship, and they high line. Everything is high line over to the other ship. And uh, When the, when the stores would come up aboard, I was in the, uh, I was one of the few, few guys that drove forklifts. And we take all the different food stores, either to the reaper units or to the dry storage. You said once, you highlined all the food to the uh, to the flight deck. How did the food get from the flight deck way down below for storage? <laughs> well, they had uh, they had elevators and their fork elevators and their space like every every five feet apart. And when they come in, they put the the cases of meat or whatever we were uh, storing below, they put them on these uh, forks. They go down. They go down to the level, and these were manned by the Marine detachment. And every once in a while, the elevator would melt, malfunction, and it just quit. So anyway, we had all the Marines from the detachment, they take and they make a, a human chain all the way down to where this stuff was going into the reefer units, refrigeration, and uh, just muscle it down. And it was just it's awing to see them. And they were working out, they were having they were having a good time showing off their muscles. <laughs> so, so the Marines did have a function for you guys on the ship. So there was something for them to do. They helped uh, they helped fill the fridges. There was a use for the Marines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were all the Marine all the Marines were my good friends. Everybody knew the night cook, and, and I was I was the good guy. And, uh, yeah, you had you had over six thousand sailors and marines on the ship. Uh, how many shifts did you guys work, and how many cooks did it take? And were you open all the time? How, how's the best guy working a ship that size? Well, uh, 
Our half galley, which was the big galley, we had uh, 10 cooks in the daytime and seven at night, which I was part of the crew. Anyway, uh, Then you had the butcher shops and bakeries. So we had about 75 cooks on board ship. And uh, everybody had a good time. You were, you know, you made a good time out of everything. <laughs> oh. Could you eat any time you wanted, or did you have to come to sign times, or breakfast was 9 to 10, and what, whatever? How did that work? Well, it worked pretty good for some, some of these guys. <laughs> some of these guys, they'd eat four times. You'd see them in the chow line all the time, you know, yeah. But we did, we, uh, we fed 23 hours a day for one good scrub, one hour of scrub down at midnight. But other than that, 23. You, to, when you're at sea, there's nothing to do but eat. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, I think most of us have seen cartoons, Beetle Bailey or Sack Sack, sitting in front of a big mound of potatoes and they're sitting there with a paring knife peeling the potatoes. Did you, were you one of the guys peeling potatoes? Oh. <laughs> That's a thing of the past. Today, they put 50 pounds of potatoes in, a, in the tumbler with the water running and then rolls them, it takes all the skins off, then they take and put it into what we call big steep tubs, and the guys that have to take and uh, iron size them, cut the eyes out, and then you cut them up, try to cut them all up, so when you cooked them, they'd all cook at about the same rate. Yeah. But every once in a while, my mess cooks would get lazy, and they'd put these potatoes in the tumblers, and they'd let them go and go. And the potatoes that started out big come out like Mims. You know. yeah. And uh, I, I confronted them and they said, well, it takes a long time to hand size 800 pounds of potatoes. So that's the way they figured they'd rectify their problem, you know. Can you imagine having to cut up 800 pounds of potatoes? <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I, I know some people can say, how many pounds of potatoes did you go through in a day and something like that? That's something Chuck doesn't have the answer to. These recipe boxes and recipes are all designed for 100 portion uh, meals. So their boss, their boss would say, make 10, 10 recipes of, well, here, okay, here we go. One of the dishes in your recipe box was SOS. Yeah. And, and, and more genteel surroundings, that would be chip beef with cream on toast. <laughs> you said you had a couple ways of preparing SOS. How did you do that? Well, we used to use uh, ground beef with the cream sauce instead of the uh, chip beef. And then we used to take uh, ground beef and make a tomato base on point toast points. <laughs> <laughs>
So if you want to make 20, uh, 200 portions of SOS, oh, Russ be here for you. <laughs> but feel free to drop in. You go to a restaurant today and we have vegetarian and we have vegan and we have pesco vegan and we have gluten free and yada 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 yada. How did you guys handle that? Well, these guys were so hungry, <laughs> they forgot what they were allergic to. <laughs> they just ate. <laughs> okay, well, you had some interesting stories from Magali. Tell us about a couple of those. They're, they're kind of funny. Well, the one that really comes to my mind it was pretty hard to believe it could happen. Anyway, this was Thanksgiving, and we got all these turkeys. So I took, I told my, I told the mess cooks and my cook striker, I said, take two turkeys per roaster. I said, load them up, put them in the ovens. Jack the heat up to 400 for an hour and then turn it down and cover them. And you'll have good turkey. Well, I don't know what made me go over to the, to open up an oven and check out and see if things were kosher. <laughs> But anyway, when I opened the, the door, these turkeys are in the oven with the plastic around them. <laughs> and all oh, that, that was really, we were just lucky I, you know, run into it so, so right away. Otherwise, that plastic would have been pretty bad. <laughs> Oh, oh my God. Another time. Another time. The last thing to be made is the coffee. So I sent domestic master at arms. He's in charge of the the dining room and that. And he's also in charge of the coffee. So I told the guys, I says, go out there, make two urns of coffee, and that ought to get us through the uh, breakfast. Well, about 20 minutes went by after we started serving, and I got people coming up and saying, God, that's the worst coffee I ever had. <laughs> and I went out there, and lo and behold, they used the salt water <laughs> to make the coffee. And that, that was a really... <laughs> Another thing that I really thought was quite quite funny. <laughs> the bake shop, they're in there breaking bacon bread and they're putting raisins in the bread. I says, oh, I like raisins. I like the raisins. How about the people that don't like raisins? Well, it kind of disguises the cockroaches. <laughs> At two o'clock in the morning, it's time for Chuck, Alex, and Rios to eat your breakfast. So we go, put three pounds of butter in the copper, and all the lobsters. <laughs> and we ate lobster for breakfast. <laughs> just about every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so
so we're sitting, we're sitting out on the uh, on the uh, mess decks, and we're sitting, we're eating, having a good time, having a good time. Anyway, uh, Chief Cannon Magley, he came through and he says, "Guys, how we doing?" He says, "What are you eating, grits?" <laughs> he says, "It's white." I says, "No, it's." Lobster, oh my God. He says, get in the galley, he says, before the officer of the deck sees this, he says, we'll all be in trouble. <laughs> but then, what do we got here? One of your jobs was for bread and water. Oh, every morning you had to go down to the brig. I had to go down to the brig. I take two mess cooks and myself, and we take bread and water down to the brig because there was always somebody in there that was on bread and water, you know. But yeah, that's other than other than that, they bring them. They bring the uh, brig rats through the line. And they get their breakfast or whatever they were eating. So they really did have bread and water only. Oh yes. How about that? I don't think I knew that. that no. That's always a story you hear about bread and water. But they they did have bread and water. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you were bad, there, we had some bad because you got to remember. Uh, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there that are being convicted of felons and you know they're convicted felons. Well, anyway, they tell them you either go to prison or you go in the service. So you know you get them people too, and there was always a place for them. <laughs> Yeah. And it was the Marines that guarded the prisoners. That was their job, right? The Marines? The Marines guarded the prisoners. Yeah. Yeah, the Marines were in charge of the brig rats. And uh, what used to amaze me on Sunday for a holiday routine, they'd have the brig rats up on the flight deck exercising them on the non-skid. And when they came down back to the to the brig, they were totally black because they had all this here black non-skid. It's uh, so that the uh, planes will have uh, traction. But anyway, they they were just totally black. Last question I have before we open it up to the audience. What's your favorite food for today? <coughs> My favorite food? I love oysters on the half shell. <laughs> <laughs> and I love as much uh, lobster as you can get. <laughs> it's, I mean, you know, since I hurt my back, I can't move around too much, and it's really hard because I only eat twice a day, and if I could eat lobster twice a day, oh. <laughs> I'd probably lose some weight. <laughs> you said that liver and onions, rare, is one of your favorite foods. That's one thing today. They got these packing plants, and they're all cutting their liver a quarter inch thick <laughs> and they're fr they freeze it and you can't really buy you can't really buy any good liver that's that's a half inch thick but i love it raw too <laughs> oh, rare <laughs> okay any questions for chuck 
I'm sure there's got to be something that can come into mind. Okay. Yeah, Susan. Um, did you just, you didn't have like breakfast, lunch, dinner, or did you, was there a transition from one meal to the next, and what did you do with your leftovers? You had, the question was, you had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, three separate meals. How are they timed, and what did you do with the leftovers? Well, we just serve it. <laughs> we serve it. And if somebody wants, and you'd be surprised how many guys just wanted the breakfast, you know, or the run over from the other meal, it'd be the same. Now, like, I used to come, I used to come to work at 6.30 at night to 4.30 in the morning. And I got my menu for mid rats. And after, after we used all the leftovers, then I'd go into that other menu. Yeah. But we didn't throw nothing away. <laughs> Chuck, did you have breakfast from what, 6 to 10, and then lunch from 12 to 2, and, and how, how did that work? Was it? Yeah. It was on normal that, time. Yeah. Your lunch, what we consider lunch time, and dinner, what we consider dinner time. That's that's about it. You got you got it right. But what, 2 in the morning, you're eating, what, what are you having? If you, if you want to eat at 2 in the morning, <laughs> other than lobster and liver. <laughs> Was there a pizza station? Well, I'll tell you. you these guys never, they never ate as good as, because we made good chow. <laughs> we were supervised. We had, all these officers were looking at, they ate that food. And it had to be good, you know. Did your ship's officers eat from your Galley, or do they have their own? No, they uh, the, the officers they had their own uh, they had their own mess. The chiefs had their own mess. There was there was probably uh, ten other messes on the ship. That used to work every day. Uh, plus, you had your what they call the cabin cabin mess. That's the captain's mess, and uh, had his uh, uh, and most of those messes that were uh, extra were all Filipino cooks. Yeah. Any more questions? Hey Chuck, I ate the food in the forest all for five years. It was pretty good. <laughs> well, I'm I, I'm glad you enjoyed it because you know I'll tell you, I just. Yeah, you <laughs> Just to give you an idea how the watchdogs were out, I had a Serbian guy, he was a second class, and he was on the coppers, and he made chip beef the way he wanted to, with garlic, and that didn't go over. You know, Chief Catamagli came through, he'd do this, he'd do this every morning. And he'd say, hmm, what do we got here? And lift, and lift the lid up. He made him dump the whole lot. He says, you save the chip beef, and you get rid of the cream sauce, and make a new cream sauce. Now, and then he was on, he was in hot soup all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Additional questions, comments? Did they have, Did they have trains?
choices, like at lunch you had two choices or just everything ate the same thing or what? We, we'd always have more than one entree. And that's why there was probably a lot of people they couldn't eat different foods and that, and this is how they they got around it. Yeah, we had a really a a wonderful choice of food. It's it's amazing because I'll tell you, there's no other branch of the service that eats better than the Navy and the Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Barbara wanted to know if you had an all-night pizza restaurant open. Uh, I, the last restaurant I had, I sold it to Louis Piazza. And he was, I met him in a tavern when I was picking my car up from being painted. But anyway, uh, this uh, little Italian guy says, Louis says, oh, he says, I got the best pizza around. And I told him, I says, I'm getting ready to close my restaurant down. How would you like to buy, the, you know, buy the, the, all the plates and that, you know, which he never used because his, his was a, uh, Carry out pizzas. Carry out. If no more questions, Chuck, thank you for coming here today. Thank you for your service. Sharon, thank you for your service for the Hopper of Chuck. Well, as you know, I'll tell you, it's been an honor. It's been an honor coming up here and, and talking to all our good veterans. <laughs>